So I'm going to just introduce someone who probably doesn't need an introduction since he's the founder and president of the Mars Society, formerly an engineer for Lockheed Martin, and now currently heads his own aerospace R&D company, Pioneer Astronautics. You know him as also a respected author on our dependency for oil, and of course for his uh, well-known book, The Case for Mars. Please welcome Dr. Robert Zubrin. Okay. Um, all right. So um, NASA is facing a fiscal tidal wave. Uh, and unless uh, we can come forward with a space program that is a lot more cost effective than the one we've had, uh, we're in danger of having no space program at all. Uh, because, you know, uh, well, I think you've all seen the news. So I'm going to come across with that. And, 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 and uh, I'm going to, in this talk, I'm going to lay out some ideas not only for a more cost-effective program, but a much more effective program uh, that does a lot more things than the space program that we've had, uh, including very much among uh, getting humans to Mars, but also doing a lot of other things as well. So um, now some of the concepts that I'm going to lay out here today can be taken separately. Um, I'd like to do them all. I think they work very well together, but if we could only do one or the other, that would still put us way ahead of uh, where we now are. Um, and it's uh, very good that I had a chance to uh, follow Paul Wooster. Is he still here? Uh, oh, because it'd be really good if he attended this talk. <laughs> um, all right. Um, because it makes use of... Um, the potentials that uh, SpaceX is uh, putting into uh, possibility for the near future. Uh, and, okay. All right. How do we open the space frontier? Um, in the uh, history of the American West. Uh, we had a trickle of settlement to the West until we had a breakthrough, which was the opening of the Transcontinental Railroad, um, before which, you know, the trip West was something in which you had to basically, if you were a person of medium means, cash in your entire life savings and take three months and have about a 30% chance of getting killed uh, to make it across. Uh, afterwards, uh, it was possible to cross the continent in less than a week for a modest ticket price. And the settlers flood west, and the cargo flood west, and the business flooded both ways, and uh, we had ourselves a continental nation. Uh, what is a similar master stroke that could be attempted that could open up the space frontier, which right now is only available in the most uh, limited way? Uh, I'm proposing an idea which, invoking uh, the transcontinental railroad, I call the transorbital railroad. Uh, and here's the core idea, uh, to cheap, create cheap access to space immediately without any technical breakthroughs being required. The core idea is simply to establish a regular scheduled launch service using the most cost-effective available boosters. Okay, so here's how it works. Okay, the shuttle program has just been retired. Um, that was a $5 billion a year program. So let's say we took 25% of that, $1.2 billion a year, to pay for as many launches as possible of the most cost-effective booster available. Okay, the payload capacity of these boosters would then be sold to both government and private customers at a cost of $50 a kilogram, a little more than $20 a pound. 
The boosters would be launched on schedule, whether their payload capacity is subscribed or not. Just like a railroad, the trains go whether the cars are filled or not. They just go. Okay? Uh, unsubscribed capacity, however, would be used to launch tanks containing water, kerosene, liquid oxygen, uh, which are, are things that are intrinsically low cost but which are quite valuable in space, which would be left on orbit to be salvaged and taken for use by anyone with the initiative to go and get them. Okay, so here's the math. All right. First of all, what is cost effectiveness? There's a lot of ways this could be calculated. Um, you could be calculated uh, simply by, uh, you know, the mass times the reliability divided by the cost. This is MR divided by dollars. Or you could have a weighted formula where if you wanted to push heavy lift, you could, for instance, uh, you know, M squared, R to the third power divided by cost or whatever. So there's, it's open for a reasonable discussion as to actually how you calculate the most cost effective. But you come up with some metric like that. Now, uh, right now, depending upon what metric you use, there's a bit of a horse race as to which is actually the most cost effective vehicle, whether it's the Falcon 9 or the Atlas V or the Delta IV. But if this uh, Falcon Heavy were to fly, um, which is a good chance here, um, uh, it would clearly, by almost any reasonable cost-effective uh, formula, uh, be the uh, winner. So let's assume that the Falcon 9 does fly and it works, uh, and it's marketed at a launch cost of uh, $80 million, which is what Elon Musk told me they would be willing to market it for. Uh, has a capacity of 53 metric tons, as Paul said. Um, so uh, with a budget of $1.2 billion per year, you could launch 15 of them about one every uh, 20 days or so. Um, the total launch to orbit per year would be 795 metric tons. Okay, for purposes of comparison, the shuttle on average in the course of the program launched about 80 tons a year to orbit for launches. So we're talking about 10 times the capacity of the shuttle for one-fifth the price or one-quarter the price. Okay. All right. So this is an a, a increase in cost effectiveness of, of about 40. Uh, now, the cost to the users, however, would, as I say, be just discounted, $50 a kilogram, $50,000 a ton, which would enable wide open, cheap access to space for both government and private ventures of every kind conceivable. Okay. Okay. So... Um, now, at NASA's present budget, which may be severely cut, actually, but still, uh, it, that's, we're talking about 6.5% of NASA's budget, uh, perhaps somewhat larger percent of the budget that NASA is likely to have soon, but still probably less than 10%. Um, all right. Now, represents a net saving to the space agency of $4 billion a year. It would also save many government organizations, such as the De Defense Department, the Jet Propulsion Lab, NOAA, large sums on their launch costs. Because they would be able to buy launches at this discount price, which, by the way, for the whole launch, you're talking $2.5 million um, per customer. That's what that price works out to. Uh, now, obviously, if we're buying launches at $80 million each and selling them at $2.5 million each, uh, on the surface, you're losing money. Uh, the user fees are paying only a small cost to the program. The only reason why we're charging user fees at all is to prevent people from taking launches just for fun. Okay. Um, we want to charge enough to keep out people who are just going to waste the space. Um, all right. Uh, but the very low cost access to space enabled uh, would allow the creation of space-based economic sector uh, whose tax revenues would pay for the transorbital railroad program many times over. That is, in addition to the fact that all these other government users would be able to basically get their payloads launched more or less for free. In other words, if JPL wants to send payloads to Mars, they just say, okay, we're going to take the April uh, 20th launch of the transorbital railroad and put down some pocket change and get the probe launched. Okay? Uh, so it would cheapen all their programs, in fact, much more net to the government than $1.2 billion a year. But I'm not even talking about that. Um, I'm talking about 
given that this would enable private users to reach space in very large numbers and attempt to implement all kinds of business plans, whether we're talking about orbital uh, industrial research labs, which is something that I think might actually have some potential if you had uh, launch costs to orbit to the user in this range. Or, of course, there are the people with the space hotels and even the solar power satellite people, which I don't believe in, but uh, this would give them a chance to let... Uh, give their chance to give their business plans a run and see what they can do. Uh, now, so there would be all kinds of economic activity created in, in space, some of which would succeed and some of which would not. Now, on average, it takes uh, $6 of GDP to create $1 uh, dollar of federal tax revenue. That is, we have a, uh, a $15 trillion GDP and we have $2.5 trillion in tax revenue. So the taxes are, are one-sixth of the GDP. So therefore, it would need to create an economic sector um, with a GDP of $7.2 billion a year to produce enough tax revenues to pay the cost of this railroad. Okay. So this is not even the fact that the railroad is saving the government itself money by letting it launch its own payloads for nothing in all these other departments. It's that this would even pay for the railroad itself. Okay. Now, this is not unusual at all in economic history. This is why the U.S. government, since its inception, has had a history of building transportation infrastructure and making it available, whether you talk about ports, canals, uh, turnpikes, um, the transcontinental railroad itself, uh, airports, bridges, uh, all these things uh, were created to enable uh, economic activity to occur which did occur. I mean, the interstate highway system has enabled enormous commerce coast to coast. Okay? You drive on that highway, they don't even charge you any tolls. Okay? But that highway is paid for. It's paid for very well by the economic activity of all those trucks traveling around on it. Um, so it's the same way here. Now, as you know, you may have heard, I'm interested in reaching Mars. Um, okay. If we had a transorbital railroad of this type, would it be possible uh, to send humans to Mars in this decade? And by the way, you can see, by the way, in terms of this transorbital railroad that I'm proposing, this is not something that I'm proposing for the year 2045. This is something that could be implemented within a couple of years. Um, the, all right. So if we have this railroad operating within a couple of years, three years, could we use this to reach Mars in this decade and at very low cost? The answer is absolutely. Okay. So uh, the best option that I can see um, for doing this, if, if, we're, if we are talking Falcon Heavies. Now, of course, if this thing's running, uh, SpaceX uh, may see some competition. People come along, see there's this business. You may see Lockheed Martin finally get their ass in gear and try to put something more cost-effective than a Falcon Heavy. All the better. Okay? Let, let the competition begin. Uh, but for now, I'll assume that the heaviest and most, and, and, and most cost-effective vehicle we have is the uh, Falcon Heavy. In this case, a scaled-down version of the Mars Semi-Direct Plan. And it has a number of advantages. Okay? And this, by the way, is the mission architecture that I published, although I couldn't provide as much details as I would have liked, in the Wall Street Journal uh, this past May. Um, so you'll now get a chance to hear more about it and be able to ask questions about it. Okay. The idea is no on-orbital assembly, no need for orbital infrastructure, no orbital refueling depots, no advanced propulsion, no need for vasimirs or antimatter uh, or anything like this, no gigantic futuristic interplanetary spaceships, no Earth orbit rendezvous, all near-term near technology, mass effective, uh, very few operations, very few hardware elements, multiple backups, uh, no long-term or very little long-term cryogenic storage requirements, and, but there is a, a hard requirement for um, closed-loop life support. Uh, and I think that is something that can be addressed. That is a key uh, thing that is needed for really any uh, Mars mission of reasonable cost. 
All right, now first I'm going to review the Mars Direct Plan, but I'm going to do it quick because I think almost everyone here has heard it before. If you need more detail on the Mars Direct Plan, it's explained in great detail in the revised copy of my book, which is on sale in the back of the room. And they'll be assigning at 5 o'clock at the close of the next session, the nuclear panel. Um, but basically, Mars Direct was predicated on a true heavy lift launch vehicle, 120 to LEO class launch vehicle. The Falcon Heavy is only a 50 ton, it's a semi heavy. Okay, so it's not as strong as would be required to do Mars Direct. But let's talk Mars Direct for just a minute. Okay, uh, we launch to Mars every other year, two boosters. A first Okay, the booster would be a heavy lift launch vehicle. This is a shuttle-derived heavy lift, but any heavy lifter would do. A Saturn V would work. Uh, something capable of throwing 40 tons or so on a direct trans-Mars trajectory. The first launch, we send an Earth return vehicle to Mars, unfueled. It lands on Mars. It has brought some hydrogen with it to Mars, which it reacts with the Martian atmosphere, CO2, to make methane and oxygen. So now you have a fully fueled Earth return vehicle sitting, waiting for you on Mars. Okay, at the next launch, you launch the HAB module to Mars. In this case, a rather capacious tuna can HAB, eight meters in diameter. The heavy lift booster has got the fairing for it, two decks, got a thousand square feet of floor space here. It's plenty of room for four people, four person crew. It, you know, here's an outline of, of one design for the HAB module, a solar flare shelter in the middle. Um, Okay, artificial gravity generated on the way to Mars by tethering off the burnt out upper stage of the booster so we do not have the debilitating effects of long duration exposure to zero G, thereby, therefore eliminating whatever necessity anyone might argue for for the need for ultra fast interplanetary travel. Okay, and there's the elements on the surface of Mars, the Earth return vehicle, the HAB module, it needed a nuclear reactor 100 kilowatts in order to be able to make about 100 tons of propellant on the Martian surface to allow direct return from the Martian surface to Earth of the Earth return vehicle with a cabin sufficiently large for four people. Uh, and then there's some other elements. You see a ground rover. You see some solar panels for backup power and so forth. Okay, and then you could land a bunch of these things and build a base. You could also use it to build bases on the moon. And so that's what you need to go to the moon and Mars with Mars Direct. All right, but now let's talk about the semi-direct plan. And by the way, the semi-direct plan, as I think uh, uh, it was discussed here this morning with Hum Mandel, that was the plan that was embraced by NASA's their design reference mission, although they went with a crew of six and they went with more equipment and heavier equipment than I would have chosen. But that is the one that allowed them to radically reduce the costs of NASA's human Mars mission plans. It eliminated the need for on-orbital assembly and on-orbital infrastructure and all kinds of other things and made the mission plan a lot cleaner. Um, so um, it involves three payloads. Um, uh, the uh, a Mars ascent vehicle delivered to the surface where it makes its propellant. An Earth return vehicle delivered to a highly elliptical Mars orbit loosely bound around Mars. Uh, which has with it enough propellant taken from Earth to kick it out of that orbit back on trans-Earth injection. Then the crew flies to mob, m Mars in a HAB, similar to the Mars Direct HAB, lands on the surface near the Mars Ascent Vehicle. They use their HAB as their house on Mars for a year and a half while they explore, and then they take the Mars Ascent Vehicle up to Mars orbit where they do a rendezvous with the Earth return vehicle, and then the Earth return vehicle goes on trans-Earth injection and they bail out in a capsule for Earth entry. Uh, now, the, um, there's some advantages and disadvantages of this plan uh, compared to Mars Direct. Um, it provides for a larger Earth return vehicle than Mars Direct, which for instance in the case of the NASA plan enabled a crew of six, which I could not have done. It allows to do the mission with less power uh, on the surface because they're not making as much in situ propellant. They only needed 30 kilowatts, Mars Direct needed 100. Um, okay. Uh, now, they nevertheless was a crew of six. What if, if, if we went with a smaller crew and took advantage of this, we could have a, a still smaller power requirement. If the MAV was kept small, the power might be able to be uh, uh, delivered by a 10 kilowatt system. And we have, or had, 
and probably could have again very quickly 10 kilowatt space nuclear power units. That was the power output of the Topaz, the Soviet system that flew in space. And conceivably, you might be able to make 10 kilowatts from solar power, which is not the case with a 100 kilowatt requirement. Um, the, uh, a Mars ascent vehicle uh, for a crew of two, well, two tons was the dry mass of the LEM uh, used in Apollo, which had, of course, a crew of two. Uh, it's conceivable that we could have a, a two-ton uh, dry mass Mars ascent vehicle. Um, the, uh, and then this also simplifies the in-situ propellant production. It allows us to go with a system where we just bring the methane and just make oxygen out of CO2, which is a simpler system. Um, which this also then eliminates any need for long duration storage of hydrogen, which we had in Mars Direct. In Mars Direct, in order to be able to do direct return from the Martian surface, we had to have very high leverage in situ propellant, where we brought the hydrogen and we got CO2 from the Martian atmosphere. That gave us a leverage of 18 to 1. Only 5% of the propellant used by the ascent vehicle had to come from Earth, because this was a, otherwise a pretty heavy uh, ascent vehicle, and we could not just bring the methane and make the oxygen, it would have been impossible. Um, the, it would have doubled the mass of the, of the mission. Um, but here, with this, such a small uh, uh, Mars ascent vehicle, we can um, bring the methane rather than hydrogen. And this eliminates the difficult requirement of storing liquid hydrogen for long duration in space during interplanetary transfer, which was one of the, the technology developments required of Mars Direct. This would eliminate that. And it also eliminates the need for trying to mine Martian water out of the soil, which can be done, but which uh, imposes uh, uncertainties into the mission. Um, it does, however, require a mission-critical Mars orbit rendezvous on the return leg. But except for Mars Direct, there is no mission architecture that does not require a mission-critical Mars orbit rendezvous on the return leg. Okay, so other than Mars Direct, you have to do a Mars orbit rendezvous, so this, this accepts that. Okay, um, the semi-direct plan was, uh, was published by uh, me and uh, Dave Weaver in 1993 and was made the basis for the NASA DRM. Okay, now my argument is if we scale this mission down to a crew of two, okay, it should be achievable with three Falcon Heavy launches. All right, so again, here is the basic mission plan. You've got... Uh, three launches every opportunity. Okay, the three basic mission elements that are launched is a HAB module, an ascent vehicle, and an Earth return vehicle. In the first year of the program, the first launch opportunity, one of each of these is ascent and no one is in any of them. Okay? In the, so that we have an Earth return vehicle stationed in Mars orbit, we have a Mars Ascent vehicle delivered to the surface where it starts making oxygen because it comes with all the methane that it needs. The oxygen is three quarters of the propellant load. That's why you make the oxygen. You, here we're accepting we're bringing 25% of, of, of the propellant. You could, by the way, uh, because I know SpaceX favors uh, RP oxygen propulsion. If that's how the Merlin is propelled. Um, you could even go with an RP oxygen uh, ascent vehicle and bring RP to the Martian surface. But it, in my opinion, it would be good to make it methane oxygen. It's not that hard to do, and that would give you greater downstream growth options because you can make methane on the Martian surface rather easily as opposed to making kerosene, which would be very hard. Uh, the, uh, so that it, it has a better growth path forward. Uh, anyway. And then the, uh, and so you have a HAB on the surface, an ascent vehicle on the surface, making its propellant an ERV stationed in orbit. Then at the next launch window, we launch three more boosters off the Cape. Okay, once again, an ERV to be stationed in Mars orbit. So now you have two Earth return vehicles stationed in Mars orbit. Another ascent vehicle gone, going to the ground. So that starts making its propellant. We already have one that's already filled with propellant. And we send a HAB module, in this case with a crew, of two astronauts in it, possibly three, if you use small people. Um, <laughs> now, everybody laughs at that. I mean, here, listen to this, okay? In everything else in space, we want things to be small and light. Okay, without question. Why not the people? 
A 100-pound person uses half the food and oxygen as a 200-pound person. Okay? This, I mean, the prejudice against small people is sizeism. And, 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 I mean, and, and really, I got to remark on this, because NASA right now is doing all kinds of, of esoteric outreach to various uh, uh, minority groups of different types. Uh, but, you know, they're completely ignoring small people, which represent a much larger fraction of the population than any of these minorities that they're expressing concern about, but, and who, in fact, uh, could do a great deal for this program. Okay. So two people if you go with the NASA size standards today, but three if, in fact, instead of looking for, you know, uh, six foot two um, cowboys and truckers, you go more with uh, five foot two gymnasts and jockeys. Um, okay. But I'll, I'll leave that for now. Um, all right. So... SpaceX is developing a Dragon capsule. NASA may also be developing a capsule, but we'll see. Um, this one has at least flown once on a dummy flight. Uh, the Dragon can actually seat, I believe, up to seven. Uh, seating two or three in it would be quite ample, but you wouldn't want to live in the Dragon for six months at a time um, if, if that was your entire living space. It would be kind of tight, although uh, people have actually lived in tighter circumstances in terms of uh, people per unit volume, for instance, on German U-boats and so forth. But uh, still, I think we can do better than that. So we would augment the habitable volume of the Dragon with uh, an inflatable. And what I'm talking about here, uh, what I'm suggesting, is an inflatable about uh, eight meters long and six meters in diameter. Uh, with two decks, so you're talking about about uh, uh, 560 square feet of floor space, 180 cubic meters of volume, that's plenty. And you can make artificial gravity in the same way as in Mars Direct by tethering off uh, the burnt out uh, trans-Mars injection stage. So now, the basic idea here is that in the Dragon, which is a rigid vehicle, you have all the actual systems, okay? Uh, everything the life support system, the power system, the comm systems, all that. This is just an inflatable uh, um, add-on, uh, which could be initially positioned either uh, on top of the Dragon or below it in an interstage position so that in, in, in that idea, the Dragon would turn around and come back and pull the inflatable out of the trans-Mars injection stage, somewhat analogous to the... Uh, um, what was done in Apollo, where they pulled the limb out of the upper stage of the S-4B. Uh, so that, you know, you could do this a number of ways. Anyway, so you have this volume, you tether off the upper stage, you spin this up, you've got artificial gravity, you've got plenty of living space. Okay. As far as living space is concerned, we could have a crew of four. The issue is consumables. Now, I, I do want to address this issue of doses, um, because... Um, the thing that is constantly chanted by the people who say we can't go to Mars until we have, you know, vasomers and 39-day interplanetary transfers is that the radiation dose is going to kill you. It's not going to kill you. The radiation dose in interplanetary space is just a factor of two, that from cosmic rays, is just a factor of two higher than that what it is in LEO because the Earth's magnetic field cannot block out gigavolt cosmic rays. It doesn't. And so the space station astronauts and the Mir astronauts got cosmic ray dose rates, 50% of that which they would have gotten in interplanetary space. Earth's magnetic field does block out solar flares, but we can shield against solar flares on the ship by using the provisions to create sufficient shielding, create a solar flare storm shelter in the Dragon. Okay. As far as cosmic rays are concerned, there's uh, a dozen astronauts and cosmonauts that have already gotten cosmic ray doses comparable to that which they would have gotten on a round-trip mission to Mars and not one has developed radiological health effects, nor would they be expected to on the basis of our knowledge of radiation health effects. There have been severe health effects from zero gravity, which NASA appears to be fully willing to accept. I'm not. I prefer to rotate the spacecraft and not have zero gravity health effects. Okay. All right, so I, I, I worked through the logistics on this. Okay. 
Now, uh, I talked with Elon Musk, and he was a bit vague on the mass of the uh, dragon, but he um, told me eight tons would be a good number, so that's the number I'm using. Um, so this goes through the mass of the different things. The inflatable doesn't have to weigh very much at all. If you made this thing uh, a, a millimeter thick and you gave it a pressure of 5 psi, which is the pressure in Skylab, 3 pounds oxygen, 2 pounds nitrogen, uh, the, the Kevlar inflatable would have uh, 10 times margin on its strength uh, and it would weigh 200 kilograms. Not much. Okay. Uh, food, you work through it. Uh, uh, I'm talking um, three quarters of a kilogram per day of dry mass food. Uh, if you assume you have food which is a high calorie, it's what's desired here, uh, that's for 2,100 calories a day, which is a recommended amount with food with an average uh, uh, dense ca caloric density of uh, 2,800 calories per kilogram. And for purposes of comparison, peanut butter is 5,000 calories per kilogram, pasta is 3,700 calories per kilogram, uh, pork chops are 2,200. Okay, so I'm talking about a mix of food which averages to 2,800. It's clearly achievable. You have to recycle the water and oxygen, otherwise this doesn't work. Um, okay, and there it is. Now, uh, by the way, Falcon Heavy. Now, I believe that the 53 ton to Leo advertised for the Falcon Heavy is sort of a, um, it's a generic number to give you a sense of the capacity of a booster. Most boosters don't actually deliver to Leo. In other words, if it was a 53 ton to Leo, they'd be really delivering somewhat less than this on, say, GTO, a, a geosynchronous transfer orbit or something like that. But nevertheless, it provides a, a good number to calculate from in terms of getting an idea of what it could probably do to uh, interplanetary orbits. Uh, so these numbers would all have to be refined based on actual performance numbers for the Falcon Heavy. But the, so these are estimates. Uh, okay, if you can do 53 tons to LEO and you're using hydrogen oxygen propulsion, you can do 17 tons to trans Mars injection. Okay which means 14 tons to Mars orbit or 11 tons to the Martian surface. So those are the numbers that we have to fall within here. Uh, 11 tons to the Martian surface, 14 tons to Mars orbit. The ERV uh, is, goes to Mars orbit, so we have 14 tons to play with there. The others have to fall within 11 tons, and you can see that they do. Okay? The, um, and as I say, it's the consumables that are driving this, but if we had smaller people, we could have more people. Okay. But I think two can do. Now, um, all right, so this is a rather crude artist's rendition of how this looked like on the Martian surface. The thing goes to Mars, okay, and you can either retract the inflatable during entry and then reinflate it, or you can dispose of it and then just have another one because they only weigh 200 kilograms. You, 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 there's possibilities. So in mission number one, here's what you have on your surface for you. You've got two Mars ascent vehicles, one of which is already fueled up and another which is in the process of fueling itself up. You've got two hams, the one that you flew out in and the one that was landed in advance loaded with supplies and spare parts and all kinds of good things. Okay. Each of the Mars ascent vehicles has to go to Mars with 10 kilowatts of power. Okay. Now here, uh, there's a, a significant amount of license here showing a rover deploying a solar array. And a solar array that could do 10 kilowatts on Mars would be pretty sizable. It would be a lot bigger than what you're seeing here. But if you could have a rollout solar array, that could be it. Okay. Another reason why having this doable with solar power is important is because if this is were to be done privately, it, nuclear materials, especially highly enriched nuclear materials that are used in space nuclear reactors are unavailable on the private market, at least legally. Um, <laughs> and um, so, uh, whereas solar panels um, are sold and they can be gotten tax-free if you buy them outside of California. The, um, so that's why driving down the power requirement to the 10 kilowatt range 
is important if you want to open up the possibility of a privately funded human Mars mission. Okay? So um, there are some solar panels, some form of robotic deployment going on. Okay, two HABs with inflatable uh, habitations attached to them and so forth, and two ERVs. They're shown flying up there in the sky. Um, okay, that's a bit of license. They would not be flying that low. Um, but, um, but nevertheless, they're up there. Um, now, so what do you have on the surface? You've got 20 kilowatts of power. And 10 would be more than enough for your life support. So you're, you're in a power-rich environment. Uh, you've got eight tons of cargo. Uh, you've got two Mars ascent vehicles. Eight tons of cargo includes all kinds of surface vehicles and so forth, uh, scientific equipment, whatever. Say by the third mission, if you keep going to the same place, the HABs all stay on Mars. So now you have four HABs on the surface of Mars. Okay, you have in this case by mission three, um, two. Uh, you've got 40 kilowatts of power. You've got two Mars ascent vehicles that have left, but they leave behind their power supplies, and two Mars ascent vehicles available for use. So at this point, you've got expanded facilities on the surface. You've probably learned how to extract water from Martian soil. So now you don't even have to transport methane to Mars anymore. You can make the methane out of CO2 and Martian water. Uh, you're, you're in business. So, the, the, so at this point, you can certainly expand the crews, even if you use oversized people. Um, OK, so the idea here is that while perhaps the initial crew might be restricted to two people, the architecture does not restrict you to that um, uh, forever. Once you have, have established a base on Mars and you're using Martian resources and so forth, you can transport much more people because these things here could easily transport four people at a time to Mars provided you had the logistics there so that the, the consumable issues were taken care of. So. Bottom line, we don't need stuff like that to go to Mars. Uh, we can go to Mars with the kind of stuff that we have or are likely to have uh, in the very near future. So um, in conclusion, um, the transorbital railroad could open the space frontier um, in really the very immediate future. I'm not talking about developing geosynchronous sky hooks and trolley cars that go up and down the super strong fibers. I'm talking about just buying rockets and launching them on schedule and making the space available to them for a subsidized rate. Um, the um, immediate possibilities, 10 times the shuttle program payload at a quarter of the cost. And by the way, because the launch costs are so cheap, this will make space hardware much cheaper. Right now, with high launch costs, okay, if, if you're going to pay uh, $100 billion for a launch, you're going to be willing and more than willing to pay for very expensive hardware in order to assure maximum possible reliability because you can't afford for the hardware to fail in space. You've got $100 million invested on the launch. If the launch is only costing you $2 million, you can buy commercial-grade hardware or things that aren't quite as proven. Uh, take your chances with it. And this, by the way, will not only cheapen the cost of hardware used in space, it will accelerate the rate of technological advance of hardware used in space. Because right now, people are very reluctant to use uh, hardware on spacecraft that isn't what they call space rated. And, uh, and, and typically, this means that the hardware used in space is at least 10 years behind what you can buy in Best Buy. It is. Um, because they want much more excessively uh, proven. Uh, this would get you past that, uh, unblock that form of blockage to progress in space. Okay. Makes access to orbit available to everyone at $50,000 a ton. Um, places large supplies in Earth orbit to be used by the venturesome. So now you can think of all kinds of, of expeditions that people mount. I mean, look, if we had this railroad running okay, in this way, well, perhaps SpaceX might decide to launch the expedition itself um, by its own space. <laughs> Two and a half million dollars in launch. Uh, or anyone else could. Perhaps we could raise the money to do it. Uh, three launches, seven and a half million dollars. 
course, the launch is not the only cost, but the rest of the hardware would cost a lot less than you're used to seeing space hardware cost now. So maybe you could do a human Mars mission for $50 million, which is the same cost as uh, a serious bid for the America's Cup. Okay? That kind of money could be raised privately. Uh, uh, enables commercial space development of every type. Um, creates, uh, which in turn will create market demand uh, not just the railroad itself, but the commercial space economy will create market demand to drive the development of ever better launch systems. Uh, and so the cost of this railroad is going to go down and the frequency of launch will go up. Okay, and by the way, I should add, because some people have commented, well, wouldn't this be anti-competitive for the United States to subsidize a transorbital railroad of this form? Anti-competitive against the Europeans? By no means. They're welcome to create their own transorbital railroad. So we could have two. Maybe three, four, if China and Russia do it as well. And then instead of sending 800 tons a year to orbit, we could send 3,000 tons a year to orbit. Okay. Um, it would create a space economy that would pay for the railroad many times over in tax revenues alone, not just in deferred costs for various government agencies. Uh, and this would, in fact, make uh, space settlement possible for those that would dare. Uh, Secondly, with regard to the specific mission architecture, uh, I think if it, the mission is really disciplined, if you use a three-launch mission structure, uh, direct launch, small crew, either two or three people, a 50-ton to orbit Falcon Heavy should be sufficient to enable a human Mars mission. Uh, there's no need for advanced propulsion or orbital uh, uh, parallel universe development. Uh, and if we had a transorbital railroad, three launches a year, uh, well, three launches every two years, in fact, out of, in that case, 30 every two years, you're talking about 10% of the transorbital railroad capability would be required to support a human mission to Mars every two years. This is something we can afford. There it is. Well, all great and honorable actions are accompanied with great difficulties and must be both enterprise and overcome with courages. That's my program. Thank you. I'd be happy to take questions. On the uh, descent vehicles, the HABs in this scenario, what tonnage are you planning for those descent vehicles and what sort of EDL package do you envision for them? Well, the Dragon, you know, is actually over-designed. Uh, that is, if you view its uh, current requirement of being able to go up and down to the space station, uh, they've got thermal protection on that that can actually take entry uh, to Earth orbit, that is, uh, to Earth from interplanetary space, excuse me, uh, let alone to Mars from interplanetary space. So, and in fact, there is a, a proposal that's uh, in the news recently, uh, Chris McKay with SpaceX proposing to use a Dragon to land a payload on Mars. It's designed for that. So I'm talking about using the Dragon to land 11 tons on Mars. Um, and that would be uh, this sort of thing. Hi, I have two questions that I think are pretty related. Um, one is, um, so I, I really like uh, the economic explanation for why the transorbital uh, railroad is such a great idea. And I'd like to see figures on how many American jobs it'll create. I'm, I personally think it justifies itself, but I know politicians <laughs> really like to hear that. And uh, secondly, do we have any congresspersons or senators who um, would be interested in advocating a transorbital railroad? I don't know um, that. This concept was first made public by me at the end of May, so it, it has not been uh, that widely uh, published. I did publish it in the Washington Times. Uh, the, I think NASA has to come through with it at this point. And I think the people who are friends of NASA got to get hold of NASA and shake them by the ears and say, look, okay, there's a fiscal tidal wave coming. Unless you can propose a program that's a lot more cost effective than what you've been doing up to now, you're going to get smeared. Okay? You've got to deliver 
a lot more than what you're doing now. So you've got to support stuff like this. First of all, you've got to support doing the job that people want you to do, which is to send humans to Mars and not come up with reasons why you can't send people to Mars. That's point one. And point two, you've got to propose how to do it in a reasonable time scale and a reasonable cost, not, you know, well, if you give me a trillion in 30 years and so forth, you know, I'll see what I can do. Um, th th that's not going to cut it. They've really got to come through with the goods right now, okay, or, or, or they're in for a massacre, okay? And we have to get to them to say, look, you have to step up to the plate. I mean, imagine what would have happened if in 1961, when John F. Kennedy was thinking about announcing a commitment to the moon, and he went to NASA and said, look, this is what I'd like to announce. I'd like to announce we're going to send humans to the moon in this decade. Can you do it? And NASA re would reply, well, actually, um, maybe 40 years, um, you know, just, if you just give us, you know, billions of dollars a year for a lot of years, and maybe in half a century we might be able to do it. How about it, Jack? Um, the, uh, it would have said no, okay? And, in fact, he would have lost interest in the human spaceflight program. And they wouldn't have done Apollo. They wouldn't have done Gemini, okay? The, the, it would have been nothing. And, and that's basically the situation now. It... it, it NASA's got to sell the product. It's got to come across with a program that deserves to be funded. Okay? Instead of coming, I mean, right now they're saying, yeah, I know there's a fiscal emergency, but we'd really like to send people up and down to the space station for the next decade at a cost of $10 billion a year in order to collect urine samples so we can study how their health deteriorates in zero gravity. How about it? Well, I don't know. Maybe there's other things we could spend that money on. Uh, like almost anything, okay? Um, and so that's what it is. I mean, the space community has got to step up to the plate and say, look, we can do better. Here's our plan. Fund this. This would, you know, open the space frontier. This would give us a new world. This would show that this country still has the stuff. Thank you. Bob, you mentioned uh, the lack of... of uh illness due to radiation. And I've heard comments or seen comments in various places that uh, the astronauts that went beyond the Van Allen belts have been prone to cataracts and that that's a risk of, of interplanetary flight. Would you care to comment on that? The astronauts that went beyond... The only astronauts that went beyond uh, the Earth's magnetosphere are the ones that went to the moon. Yeah. Okay. That's the story. Uh, that would have to be an urban lit, uh, myth. The amount of uh, cosmic radiation dose that they took was very small, um, much smaller than that which the people who have inhabited the space station for any um, significant period of time. You, you haven't heard those rumors or anything? No. Okay. Well, okay. All right. Thank you. All right. Uh, I'll just yell. Uh, in the two-person crew, remember the early missions that you... You would be good for this crew. <laughs> <laughs> Besides being small, what other qualities would a crew member have to possess? Like, would you send up a pilot and a doctor or a hybrid of both? Or The two most important skills for this mission, first and for foremost, the skill of the flight mechanic. You really want to have, I mean, we really have two people that were good in both of these, but if I wanted to, to, to divide them into two people, okay, you have a person who's really good at fixing things because the ability to fix and uh, repair equipment and improvise mechanically and electrically is the most important skill in terms of the success of the mission. That's number one. The pilotage can be automated, you know. The navigation's all done on Earth, okay, the, but... The fix it there, okay? That's number one. And the second most important skill on the mission is that of field geologist. Because we're going to Mars to explore a planet and to have the skills to be able to do field science and really extract knowledge from your observations and understand and find the resources and, and do the discoveries, find if there's life on Mars, that is, he's the scientific payload of the mission. So those two skills. So we want one Scotty and one Spock. And also, um, I notice a lot of astronauts now, if they're not mission specialists, they're mostly pilots. And um, obviously the psychological aspect is going to be taken into mind, because you, if you have two people, 
in a small confined space. You don't want them to murder each other before they get to Mars. And um, has anyone ever considered using people who work on submarines since they have well, been in uh, a similar environment? Well, submariners, of course, have um, demonstrated a certain ability to work in confined uh, spaces for long periods of time, and it has sometimes been suggested that they would be a good group of people to recruit from. Uh, based on uh, my own experience with the Mars Society's uh, Arctic and Desert Research Station, I think the most important uh, uh, character trait that is needed for a member of a crew is a sense of humor. Um, you lose your sense of humor on your way to Mars, you're finished, okay? Um, the, the, but, no, I mean, really, the ability to laugh at adversity, to laugh at setbacks, to say, you know, here it is, this is life, uh, and, and take it in stride. Uh, that, that's needed, and, um, and there are people like that. Uh, and you want people who can act as a team. Um, and whether we have two people or three people, okay, we'll want to take them, we'll want to put them in a hab up there in the Arctic for a year and task them to do a sustained program of field geology under conditions of isolation in Mars simulated mission and see if they hang together as a team. We'll take, you know, I mean, given the small size of the crew, we could have five different such candidate crews out there in five different Arctic hams, test them all and see which really, you know, have the one for all and all for one spirit. Um, okay, thank you. You're too tall. <laughs> I'll go on a diet. Um, <laughs> Uh, Dr. Adam Bruckner has come up with the term impulsive launch. And I'm not talking about something real far out like a magnetic sled or something, but uh, hydrogen gas guns currently hold the record for muzzle velocity at 11.2 kilometers a second, and NASA's uh, got that record now. And I was wondering, uh, would you consider impulsive launch as a contender for your um, uh, passage to LEO? Well, uh, there are people, I mean, there's somebody here who's an expert in light gas guns. I believe he's giving a talk uh, tomorrow. And you should, there he, there he is. Uh, um, he's got the gun. Um, so there are gas guns, ram accelerators, things like this, that uh, of necessity, since they have high G loads, they're more appropriate for delivering cargo to orbit than uh, people. Uh, but, you know, that's something that more development is needed on, and that's why I'm not proposing this part as this mission architecture. Look, let me make something clear, by the way, because a lot of people say Zubrin's against technology development. He's a spoil sport. He's there, you know, dissing this and dissing that. Okay, what I'm dissing is the idea that we've got to stop the program until we have such futuristic technologies. Okay, if you had a program going like this, then you say this is what we're going with now. But these other capabilities, X, Y, and Z, represent substantial enhancements and improvements to our capability, and we should have active programs to develop them. That's why we were developing the NERVA program at the very same time we were doing Apollo. We didn't need NERVA to do Apollo, but we needed it or wanted it to do the next step. Okay? So we didn't say, oh, we will stop. We won't go to the moon until we have a whole bunch of, of things that would be good to have. We go to the moon with what we got. We go to Mars with what we got and we develop more advanced technologies in parallel and bring them on when they're ready to go. Thank you. Yeah, I've, I've been inside M1 tanks, so I barely fit it inside these M1 tanks. Yeah, but okay. if you've been with the Marines, the, uh, the Marines that are going those tanks are usually really strong guys, but they're about this tall, okay? So if you had like a male-female M1 tank team, that would be perfect for you guys. Okay. okay. <laughs> All right, thanks. Mm -hmm. Next. Um, got, a, got a question about the uh, HAB that you showed. Uh, NASA hasn't really deployed that, uh, but you've got Bigelow working on it. How close uh, do you think their technology is to being what uh, you would need? And is your storm cellar going to be in that HAB? Because it seemed like you have to modify the Dragon significantly to put the storm cellar in there. Uh, I'm not so sure about that. The Dragon... Uh, my first instinct would be to put the, the, the cellar in the dragon. Okay, I, I want to put everything necessary in the dragon, because this other thing is just kind of a balloon to inflate and add on. And I, I, all I want to have to string out into there is a bunch of lights and fans and some stuff like that. Uh, the, uh, but the, the dragon, uh, it's, it, it's like a... Um, 
only a portion of that uh, uh, um, cone there is the actual living space of the dragon. There's space around it, okay, which could, for instance, be filled with bladders with water in it and, and things like that that could then be plumbed into the, the uh, actual pressurized space of the dragon itself. I, I believe it could be done, um, and uh, it would be my preference. Okay. And what about the... Now, by the way, the dragon... Uh, they developed the dragon pretty fast, and, and right now the dragon has uh, a fairly small uh, diameter um, shell at the bottom, which is compatible with the Falcon 9. Uh, and I believe one could scale this thing up a bit to be compatible, take advantage of larger uh, diameters that could be available on a Falcon Heavy. And what about the inflatable? Where do you think we are on that technology? Well, the inflatable, the, the Bigelow inflatable is much more over-designed than this, okay? And, uh, I mean, I spoke to them, and uh, they're, they're putting shielding in it and this and that. They're, they're designing this thing for space tourists, okay? Um, I'm not proposing to put any shielding in this inflatable, okay? I'm proposing to keep this inflatable light, okay? And, uh, I mean, it's more than strong enough for the pressure, tenfold margin, made of Kevlar, creates a lot of living space, but... Uh, this is an exploration mission to Mars. This is not a vacation for the rich on orbit where I have to guarantee they get no radiation or something. Um, well, at five, six, I'm happy to volunteer myself as a okay. large, small person. <laughs> but what I want to ask is, in the way the Internet is causing the print industry to restructure itself right now, what sort of commercial interests do you foresee as not being able to support this endeavor once it's started? Sort of commercial interests as being not able to support it? Well, I mean, without changing itself, these print industries are at right now, you know, failing or succeeding based on how they're adopting the new technologies. Um, I'm just wondering if, say, energy or mining would be would have the most interest in supporting this transorbital railroad. Well, the transorbital railroad. Okay, opinions differ on this. I mean, I think uh, well, obviously, communication satellites and so forth, and uh, orbital radio and orbital television and so forth can all be done with. Uh, uh, orbital uh, launch systems and to some ex real extent are. Uh, I think kind of things that could happen that, that aren't happening now, things that were talked about for the space station but were not realistic for the space station like orbital uh, research, taking advantage of zero, zero gravity to make crystals and so forth. None of this was realistic for the space station because of the institutional environment is all wrong, the impossibility of getting certification to do anything, the impossibility of maintaining uh, trade secrecy and so forth uh, in, in such research. But, you know, if you could, you know, if you were some... Uh, uh, you know, Pfizer or somebody like this, and you wanted to do drug research, and you could have your own orbital research lab and get it launched for two and a half million dollars. Um, well, now we're talking business. Um, I mean, that you know, that's a very doable thing. Um, the the uh, then there are the space hotel people who might actually now have a shot with if there was a, a, a transorbital railroad, they could get their hotels launched, and people could get up and down to it. Um, the uh, then I think we could have a lot more um, scientific exploration. You could have National Geographic Society sending its probes to Mars, okay, at these kinds of costs. Okay, these are the kinds of costs they might put in for an expedition to Everest. Um, the, so we'd have a lot more exploration, as well as by JPL or by various universities and so forth. Um, and then perhaps, I mean, depends what you find on Mars. There might be mineable minerals on Mars. I've always tended to believe, though, that a Mars colony, that its exports won't be minerals. It'll be inventions. Uh, it'll be patentable inventions. Uh, they're much easier to transport over interplanetary space and license them on Earth. But because you'll have a frontier environment here where people are, are being very much driven to innovate, and they're going to want to have maximum yield from their greenhouses and so forth, and um, and, and those sorts of things, new crop strains, uh, whatever, uh, 
labor-saving robotic techniques, um, automation systems. These are the sorts of things that would be developed by this program, either uh, on Mars itself or uh, in the ground-based uh, groups supporting it. This, this would produce profit. Uh, just one more thing. For, um, I think I've heard you mention presence of deuterium in the Martian atmosphere. There's pres deuterium is uh, six times more common in Martian hydrogen than it is in Earth hydrogen. So, in fact, if we had, well, deuterium is quite valuable today for many purposes. You don't have to wait till there's fusion power for fu deuterium to be valuable. It's valuable now. Deuterium is, is used in heavy water moderated nuclear fission reactors, for example, and allows you to use natural uranium as fuel. Uh, deuterium also has various other uses. Um, so uh, deuterium is more valuable than gold today. But uh, if we went to a fusion economy, deuterium would st be still more valuable, and, and that could uh, be, be as well. Next. Thanks. So orbital rendezvous. I notice you uh, have an orbital rendezvous stage at uh, Mars, yeah, but not one at Earth. Couldn't you drastically increase your tonnage to tr trans-Mars injection if you were to add a orbital rendezvous stage at Earth? Send the gas can up, send a pusher up, link them up. Well, yeah, uh, no. you could do that. Um, if I mean, for example, if you wanted to make this a six-launch mission instead of a, uh, a three-launch mission, you could launch. You know, two of these, and one just has a big trans-Mars injection stage, and the other has a payload and a rather small trans-Mars injection stage, and you mate and dock them, and away you go. That's conceivable. Um, if you wanted to significantly enlarge the payload and, uh, and enlarge the crew, um, perhaps be able to bring people as large as you. Um, the... the um, uh, no, th that's definitely possible. Uh, what I decided to do in proposing this was to be as ruthless as possible in proposing um, the minimum required to do it. Um, and then sort of more or less stand here and insist that someone show me why I need to do more. Uh, because it's always possible, if you just take the mission and somebody says, well, what do you, well, let's do a Mars mission. What do you think would be a good crew? And someone says, well, uh, how about 10 people? And says, well, no, we should have an odd number so the votes won't be tied. Let's make it 11. And, the, uh, and we should have this and we should have that. And, of course, there's a need for a pool table because, um, you know, and the, the uh, no, I, I mean it. I mean, I, I've seen mission designs, NASA mission designs, where people just come in and they argue for everything that might be desirable. And perhaps in, in all cases, these things are desirable. But you then come up with a mission that has an initial mass in, in Earth orbit of 600 tons or something, and you say, well, there it is. Wouldn't that be nice to do? But of course, we can't afford it. What, what I, I believe very strongly that the thing that will determine whether we go to Mars or not will be cost. Okay, th that's live or die here. It's the cost threshold that will determine it. And what is needed are mission designs that go at that as ruthlessly as possible. Um, and then if, if, if someone says, well, you know, this is just pushing it too far, uh, you're going to have to add more mass here. Then you say, gee, I guess on this one payload element, I, I, I need an extra launch or something. But I'm saying show me. Uh, and I think this gets the job done, and it gets the job done with a booster that we're likely to have rather shortly. Thank you. Uh, <clears throat> I'm from Florida where tourism is very big, and it's been estimated that tourism is perhaps the second or third largest industry in the world. I remember being in Tallahassee about 30 years ago, stopped into the tourist development office and asked them how they felt about space tourism. And the gentleman's face lit up and he said, oh, yeah, absolutely. Aren't those double-decker buses at Kennedy Space Center just the greatest? <laughs> now, when you talk about $50 a kilogram, I did a quick arithmetic and that would be about $5,000 for me. And uh, 
even if uh, you'd have to multiply that several times because of the life support systems. If you could get a ticket around $25,000 to space, the demand would absolutely explode. Do you have any comments on space tourism? Well, if we could uh, reduce the cost per user to about this level, then yes. Uh, you know, $20,000 a ticket, it's a bit steep, but people pay that for certain kinds of expensive vacations and so forth. Uh, I don't think space tourism uh, has much of a future at $500,000 a seat. But 20000 yeah. So maybe there could be space tourism. I have other issues with space tourism myself. Uh, that I, I think it's like the Hindenburg. You know why the Hindenburg was such a disaster? It's because rich people were on it. No, that's true. That's also why the Titanic was such a disaster. Okay, plenty of men get killed in disasters at sea all the time, especially in that period. But you don't even know about it. But the the the, the thing that shut down the Zeppelin uh, uh, um, tourism or you know luxury air travel was the the, the assortment of people. And uh, I mean, if if the Zeppelin before that had gone down, Rockefeller would have gone with it, which maybe would have been. Okay, but uh, the uh, uh, anyway. Um, so if you have if you have space tourism, which is based on um, a few extremely wealthy people going up and down, um, first of all, then it's just something for very wealthy people. And second of all, when they have their first accident, they, they've got passengers with very well equipped lawyers. Um, but yes, this would make po space tourism conceivably possible and conceivably profitable and conceivably open to significant numbers of people. Uh, so that's one thing that it, it, it could enable. Yes? Very quickly, I haven't read too much about the impact of Martian weather on these missions, either when they were approaching Mars and now you have that three-month bus storm that comes up or you're on the surface. Can you comment about that a little bit? Yeah. Um, the... Martian weather is of greatest concern while you're actually in aero entry and landing. Because then the high Martian winds at altitude can take your parachute and crash you. Okay, but once you're on the ground, the dynamic pressure of the Martian winds is actually very modest. And look, opportunity has been on the surface of Mars now uh, for seven years uh, and is still operating. And it's gone through plenty of dust storms and so forth. And uh, the, even the one thing that a lot of people were concerned about with dust covering up the solar panel, the winds have helped blow the dust off. Uh, and Viking lasted on Mars for uh, five years uh, and, and so on. So uh, it, it does not seem to be that great a hazard once you're on the ground. So the ideal is to aero capture into Mars orbit, make sure the weather's clear, and then enter. Yes. Um, I'm noticing a problem and a solution, and you've built both of them into it. The problem, I don't see any, any ground vehicles here, but I'm also thinking that you're with the transorbital railroad, you may not have three vehicles, you may have 12 vehicles, but one of them is going from Kawasaki and another one from Caterpillar. If you expand that all the way to the surface, where they may sponsor their own things the same way that... Uh, the Asimo robot is built by a car company in Japan, that sort of thing. Well, look, if you have here basically a standardized package for delivering 11-ton payloads to the Martian surface, you can deliver extra payloads to the Martian surface loaded with all sorts of cargoes, including Kawasaki, all-terrain vehicles, and so forth. Uh, there's a lot of tons of cargo that is actually being carried in, in, in those Mars ascent vehicles and so forth that we're just not showing. But yes, you could have additional flights of dedicated cargo delivery. I'm over time, um, so I'm going to end this. And uh, I'd like to invite up the nuclear panel. Uh, David Budin, uh, Harold Finger, uh, Stan Gunn, and uh, Mike Williams.